Hi, I'm Mitch Hurwitz, and you're watching Entertainment Focus. First of all, Mitch, thank you very much for joining us today sure, on Entertainment Focus. Um, first of all, okay, Arrested Development already has a huge fan base in the UK, and it's well loved by everyone. But uh, for those unfortunate few that haven't caught it yet, um, can you tell us a little bit about the show? Well, uh, it's a show about a dysfunctional American family, or as we like to call it, a family. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, it's a show that I think, in many ways. Um, is, is made for British television because it, it, it more so even than American television it, it is very much in the style of Faulty Towers I think that was that was a big inspiration uh, certainly to me as a writer but but it, in the tone of the show the idea of people taking uh, making life or death situations out of the most banal mundane uh, occurrences in their lives and I think everybody in Arrested Development takes themselves very seriously and they get to very daft places that that uh, hopefully will make you laugh. Okay. Um, how was it uh, casting the show? And uh, did you get everyone you wanted on board? I'm still not on board with Will Arnett. I'm still <laughs> yeah. uh, open to casting suggestions. Okay. So I do want to make that clear. Okay. Okay. Um, casting the show, you know, it's a funny thing. In, in American television, you have a very short time to put a cast together for a show. And as a writer, I was... I think kind of secretly hoping we wouldn't cast it so that I wouldn't have to immediately write all the episodes that, that are incumbent upon a writer in, in, in American TV, because we did make 22 a year, I mean, it's, it's a back-breaking amount of work. Nonetheless, they were very specific characters. Um, I had kind of embraced this idea in the writing of this, that it would be all about detail. The characters would just be as multi-layered as I could make them, because I, I came from a long history of writing kind of stock characters, which. American television does very well, um, especially when you have a laugh track, you know, and the shows are very short, you've got 20 minutes to tell a story, you tend to really abbreviate things and, and caricaturize characters. Um, but this one, I, I, it, was, it was an exercise in, in finding complexity in the characters. So it was challenging to, to cast it. I had seen Michael Sarah uh, in uh, some pilot he made, and it was you know, as an audience is with Michael Sarah, not completely sure if he's, is he as good as it seems he is? And, and he certainly is. And actually his story was, I had requested an audition from him. And about three weeks went by and the casting director said to me, great news, Michael Sarah likes the script. And I, that really impressed me. You know, just that right there. It's like, wow, that, that, he, he's discerning? He's 14 years old, and that's very impressive. So he liked the script, and he recorded um, an audition, except that he had the camera across the room, and I, I kind of picture him in his mother's bedroom or something. I just I picture a bed in the foreground. And he did his audition, um, and it was so subtle, as he is, that you almost couldn't tell if he was doing anything. And I remember showing it to people, Ron Howard and a couple other people, and we all asked ourselves, you know, is this kid that's standing very stiffly and doing his lines like this, is that a choice? Is he making a choice or is he just a kid? Well, of course it was a choice. He's a very confident young guy and, you know, even more so now, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, that was just a stroke of luck. Um, Jason Bateman came in and I think I had, you know, he had been a, a teen actor and kind of a teen idol in the States. So when I saw his name on the casting list, I remember thinking, oh, I hope this guy's not that good because they're going to make us use him because he's kind of got a name thing and I really want to get somebody great for this. And he came in and was just great. I mean, just exactly what you see on, on camera on that show. Uh, and suddenly I was saying, oh, we got to get this guy. And then I brought him to Fox and instead of Fox saying, well, we, he's the guy we're going to get on this, when they saw his name, they said, oh, I don't, I don't know if we want to do the Jason Bateman pilot. He just had baggage, you know, it's just, um, it was an interesting lesson and in you just really don't know what people are capable of when you judge them, you know, by prior work or, you know, it's just like anything, when you judge anybody, yeah. you really are, are limiting, you know, what you can, what, what that person has to offer. But he was marvelous and we could not cast the part of Job. Uh, we saw some wonderful actors. To me, the part was so clear. Um, you know, there were elements of it in my family that I was pulling, drawing upon. So I, I saw it very clearly. For some reason, everybody read it kind of New York. There was a line in it where he said, you got a buck, and he's doing a magic trick for the kid. Got a buck, give me a buck. And everybody said, got a buck, 
give me a buck. And they did this whole kind of street thing. And I thought, oh, but God, why is nobody getting this? This kind of entitled country club affect. Uh, and we went to, uh, we auditioned some people at the network and nobody got it. Uh, and I remember the head of the network saying, well, Mitch, this is how projects fall apart. You know, you don't have the brother, you don't have the mother. And the casting director, um, uh, Deb Borilski, said, wait, I've got somebody. You know, casting directors tend to have somebody that they love in their back pocket, that that's kind of their discovery. And Will Arnett was her, and she'd used him in a couple things. And I'd never heard of him. But she said, we're, we're going to get Will Arnett in on this. And I said, Will's amazing. you got to let us bring Will in. And I had no idea who he was. And he came in, and, you know, I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, Just now that, it's right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he's such an original. And he'd been doing dramatic work which is just stunning to me every time I see him do the chicken dance. I think this was a dramatic actor just waiting to blossom. You know? um, every one of them was like that. Every one of them was so fortunate uh, for me to discover. Um, I obviously knew David Cross, was a big fan of his. I called him at one point and said, is there any part you like? You can play any of them. And I kind of thought he was going to say Job, which was not how I saw Job, but it, at least it would have solved that problem for me. And he liked Tobias, which I was surprised about because it wasn't the biggest role but he kind of so makes it his own doesn't he completely it completely just... makes it his own and he makes you know he makes his acting style as it turns out he's a very good actor but it, at the time he was kind of coming from sketch and his acting style was slightly different than the other people on that show and it made sense because he's an in-law he wasn't quite you know a product of that family and that dysfunction he had his own crazy thing that um you know that I don't know what you would call that detachment or whatever that thing is he does. Yeah. I remember the first day we shot with him, because I never auditioned him, obviously. We'd been shooting for about three or four days. Everybody was doing these hyper-realistic portrayals, you know, and I remember being in the room, across the room, and David Cross came in, and, he, and I said hello to him, we talked a little bit, and then he started acting in the scene. Michael! How are you? And I, I broke into a sweat. I thought, what, what is he doing? What, what is this thing? You know, it's, it's almost like he's pretending to be a grown-up. But of course, that is what he was doing. He was doing a guy that was just so disconnected from his self. And just so awkward about it. So awkward, else. so self-conscious, yeah. without realizing any of those things. And it just worked wonderfully. Oh. And how was it casting um, Lucille and Maybe? Because they're really strong characters and you wouldn't think that they would be in other sitcoms. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Maybe, you know, it's very tough with kid actors because, you know, there's an on-the-nose way to write them as precocious. And then there's the twist on that where they're not very precocious, which is now also kind of a trope. And, the, you know, yeah. it's very tough to find a fresh take on a kid. Um, in fact, when I when I wrote George Michael, I remember that was a bit of there was a bit of contention about that um, at the network. Like, well, I don't get it. He doesn't seem like a Fox kid. He doesn't seem like a flashy kid. It's like, no, he's not. <laughs> he's not a flashy kid. Um, he's who I was until like about an hour ago. Uh, maybe the my thought on maybe was that she would be a complete risk taker, right? And that he would be fearful and she would be fearless. I mean, I had certain kind of archetypes in mind for this. Um, but the other thing I wanted to add was that she was really, the ways that she pushed her mother's buttons were really that she was really conservative and really Christian and, you know, but just putting it all on. Because my idea of Portia's character was kind of a plagiarism of the Aida Torturo character in The Sopranos. I wanted her to be kind of a hippie and, you know, kind of this bogus liberal, you know, and, um, but she ended up you know, what she was playing was kind of a, um, uh, a version of the mother. You know, it was much more like the mother's child than the, re the rebel. Yeah. So my original idea was that Portia was a rebel against Lucille, and Alia was a rebel against Portia, so she was always saying things like, I'm entering a beauty pageant, you know, and all those things. In fact, there's still a thing in the opening credits where you see her in this little beauty pageant outfit. Um, but because Portia played and really made us laugh with this version of, of Lucille, uh, we ended up going a little more on-the-nose rebel with Maybe. It was only about 12 and a half when we cast her. And I actually found her from a, a still photo, and I loved her look. And she came in, she was just so great, you know. And the funny thing about Alia and Michael Sarah, Alia Shokat, she actually pronounces it Shok Shokat. 
uh, I don't, um, and I'm older, uh, was that they were really the opposite of their characters. George Michael, Michael Cera was a very confident young man, and he played, a, you know, very, no confidence. And Alia was a little girl and very shy, very self-conscious, I think. And she played, you know, with a, a character that had no self-consciousness and, you know, was out there and bold and... So sometimes that, that opposite thing really works. Yeah, okay. uh, Lucille, I, um, I'd known of Jessica Walter, but I hadn't really known of her comedic work. And she was just completely inhabited, this character. And she's a very, um, I don't know if she, how trained she is, but she, she seems as if she's a very trained actress. She's, um, She's very um, tight and concise, and she needs um, she she needs to know what the props are because she'll use them to comedic advantage. She'll say, "Well, I need to close this door and then say my line," or you know, "I need to open the drawer, not see what I want, close it, and then be angry and say my line." And what was interesting about that style was Jeffrey Tambor is just the opposite. Jeffrey Tambor just is reactive and doesn't know what's going to come out of his mouth and sometimes barks a line and sometimes says it quietly and so he's so he just kind of organic to the scene and the, those two styles i think that the the, um, the dialectic between those two styles really created some comedy for those yeah. two okay um, right so um, i apologize it's an obvious question you've probably been asked it a lot but uh, what is the status of the arrested development movie and can you uh, tell us anything about it the arrested development movie it has actually come and gone it's been in theaters and uh, no one saw it it's gone <laughs> But we're hoping to turn it into a TV series. Oh, God. So that might work. Really, yeah, yeah. That's, um, I am in the process of writing the Arrested Development movie with my my longtime uh, comedic lieutenant and and writing partner Jim Vallely. Um, you know, it's a very we've we've gone we've written this a few times. We've we've sketched out the movie, um, and then one thing or another happens that delays it, and then what we've written no longer is very timely. You know, the economy changes or, you know, and all of a sudden there's, there becomes new material. And, you know, we kind of like to be in the moment with this, with this show. You know, they're, they're, it's always been kind of a reflection of its time. So it, it keeps changing. But now I, our sincere hope is that it's this year. Writing it this year, we want to shoot it this year. Everybody's on board. For a while, we were pretending Michael Sarah wasn't on board because we wanted to kind of yeah, we got that from the yeah. Comic Con <laughs> stuff. Then, yeah. But then he started getting death threats. Basically, like, okay, let's we're gonna say he's on board. Uh, so uh, we're very hopeful. Okay. You know, a lot of things have to fall into place to make to get a movie out there. It's just a, such a different business than TV. Yeah, um, but we are hopeful. Brilliant. And we are appreciative of people's interest in it. I mean, I, the one thing I hate to do is make it seem like we're teasing an audience because it's the fact that anybody's interested at all is is such a gift to us. It didn't happen at the time. Yeah. You know, we didn't have an audience at the time, so it's very meaningful. Oh, great. And finally, uh, can you tell us a bit about Running Wild and whether we actually get it in the UK? You know, I don't know if it'll ever get here in the UK. We only aired six. We made 13. We aired six. Arguably we aired the less ambitious six, which is something American television tends to do. It's, it's a little cautious, you know, there's a lot of money at stake, and it's a big country, and you gotta please a lot of people, and sometimes when you take out all the objectionable bits that, that somebody would offend, be offended by on either side of the political or financial spectrum, you, uh, you end up with the part that nobody wants. So I, I think the first six were not our most successful, the second six, which will be airing on FX in the States, will hopefully get an audience, and I think if it does, then it has a chance of, of coming here. Yeah. But then we'll see if there's TV anymore, if everybody will just be watching things on their iPad, on demand. <laughs> we'll see. Well, Mitch, thank you very much for joining thank us today. You. Thank, thank you. you.